All right, I think we are all set up. Today we are doing a different type of video. As you can see, I have somebody special visiting us. And you have seen her a little bit in several videos before. She is the one who has given me a scalp massage and all of those lovely things. So today we're sort of going with the series I've done in the past called Psych Chats. And this is going to be a little bit more informal since the two of us are speaking here today together. She is also a therapist, so we're coming from a perspective of that field and also as best friends. And so we're going to talk about things in the therapeutic context, but we're also going to give some personal stories. So yes, this is an ASMR video, but note that the sound might be a little bit different. We're going to be fidgeting with some things here and there for your enjoyment. Now, the video topic for today is healthy female friendships. And we're going to go into several aspects of what that really means and what it might look like as we move through the lifespan. So let's get started with, I guess, my best friend. I don't know what to call you. Um, yeah. Best friend will work just fine. <laughs> Perfect. So, yeah, we're going to start by first acknowledging that when we're talking about female friendships, we're talking in language that is very um, binary, but these concepts we're going to talk about are applicable no matter how or who you are. So why don't you tell us a little bit first um, how you identify healthy female friendships? Mm. Yes, that's a big question. And I'm just going to go ahead and light a candle as we talk about this. As you know, I am very engaged in creating ceremony and ceremony to hold important things. And sometimes there's just something nice about lighting a candle before these kinds of discussions. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big question of how to define healthy friendships. I know for myself that our friendship has been the healthiest friendship that I've ever had. And so you've taught me a lot about how to to engage and to be vulnerable and Something that stands out to me is that we both share and offer equally. It's a very reciprocal relationship. And I think as therapists, that is something that has become more and more important to us as we hold space for so many and then to be able to safely hold space for one another is truly a gift yeah. and I've been able to be vulnerable with you and that has led to this sense of connection and intimacy and friendship that I really value. Yeah, and you're touching on a really important piece that I know you and I discussed before coming on here and that is the idea of leaning into vulnerability. And so part of what makes a friendship feel solid and healthy and sustainable is when we allow ourselves to lean into vulnerability. And just like you were saying, how um, I have offered you that, you have obviously done the same. And it's really interesting to see how even when vulnerability is difficult, 
or scary, or we feel like in our vulnerability, we've made a mistake. It also is vulnerable to seek to repair. And I think that's a part that comes up in friendships too, is how do we repair in a healthy way too, when there has been hurt feelings, feeling judged or feeling left behind or left out. And that, yeah, that's something we can kind of circle back to also um but yeah just that mutually sharing and vulnerability is something that definitely is almost foundational to a healthy sustainable friendship yes i i do believe that i've experienced that and also i would like to add that you know, with healthy friendships too is that while we both may experience jealousy at some point, those different kinds of ruptures that you were talking about, where we may be somewhat out of sync with one another, that when there are ruptures and being able to come back to them, there is also this element of just naming what comes up. So like with jealousy, I know that's not something that we have majorly with one another, but I know that I feel, I feel safe of saying, Oh my goodness, that that made me feel a little insecure or sad. Yeah. While overall, I think something really beautiful about our friendship is that our instinct is to get really excited for one another and yeah. happy for one another when when good things happen so true that's so so true and and we have and just for all of you listening you know i have a child now and a toddler and bestie here does not. So we're in a little bit different life stages. And when that happens, I know many of you can attest to certain friendships, whether it's having a child or another big life transition. Some friendships survive it and other times they don't. Sometimes we leave friends behind. And what's been so amazing is that even though the life paths right now look different in some ways, not all, that we're able to sort of transcend the circumstances of life. And so going back to the idea of a healthy female friendship or healthy friendship is not just the vulnerability we offer, but also this non-defensive communication. And that goes in several ways, just like she was saying, talking about feeling safe and free to say, oh, I feel jealous. You know, sometimes we joke about it. We don't live near each other. So she's made new friends where she moved and that's wonderful. And there is a genuine joy in my heart for that, especially when she was first establishing herself there. And when she hangs out with some of them and go out drinking and having fun, things that we can't do, sometimes I feel jealous. And so I say like, oh, I'm so jealous. I, you know, we get... I pretend to be territorial, but then it doesn't feel very pretend. <laughs> and um, But there's this non-defensive communication because she laughs or she says, yeah, I know. I remember feeling jealous when you blank. So instead, she could be like annoyed. She could be triggered by me by feeling like I expect something from her or I don't want happiness for her. And so this is where we can get caught up in these sort of toxic uh, traps, so to speak, when we're not thoughtful and when we react defensively, so we're coming from a place of defense, this is when it gets a little bit challenging. And sometimes two people in a friendship cannot communicate in such a way that we work through that or we sort of unpack it. And not only is there not the capacity to work through it is sometimes there's not that safety and vulnerability to sit with it. 
And so just like that, we're talking about these major components of leaning into vulnerability, mutually sharing vulnerability, and engaging in non-defensive communication. So really always giving the other person the benefit of a doubt. So when I tell her, oh, that makes me feel jealous, she doesn't automatically go to, she's expecting too much of me. She doesn't want me to make a new life here. She's unhappy. And so she wants me to be unhappy. That's not where she goes. She goes to open heart and listening and saying like, yeah, that I could see how that would make me jealous or, but ultimately no, that truly in my heart, I always have her best interest in mind that yes, if I felt jealous or something, the joy I have for her finding friends and building a life, it trumps anything else that might come up. And that leads us to this topic of platonic intimacy, which I don't think is talked about enough. And just recently, I had seen, maybe it was on Instagram, some that phrase, and like in the mainstream. And I, I think that it is not discussed, especially in the context of women-oriented friendships. I'm wondering... Um, what do you think about that? Or what what are your comparisons between past friendships and friendships now as an adult? Mm. Yes, I as you were talking about the different qualities and ability to connect and talk about things, it also makes me think of of what we've connected on. You know, that we did meet in graduate school in the counseling program, but our connection was never defined by that exclusively. And so while we may have enjoyed going out on a Friday or Saturday night together, it was never like you were my drinking buddy or just my friend from school. And I think that what is different is that as a younger person, it, because my relationship with myself was very, was resting on my identity qualifiers, that what sports I did or where I lived or what kind of clothes I wore, or what music I liked, those things were really defining of who I was, which is really typical at that age. And to relate to one another based on those identity markers is something that's really common and necessary. It's necessary at that stage of life where you are seeking to rest in that container, that safety of of the the markers of the labels even and that's necessary but if we're lucky and if we are aware and intentional we outgrow that and look for connection based on other things for instance with us while you may be defined as a mother and living in the type of area that you live and I am not a mother and live in a very different kind of area and we spend our free time doing different things but our connection is based more on what we value and what we value and how we show up in the world how we show up for each other and even how we show up for ourselves Definitely. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to pause really quick. Hold on. You make such a wonderful point about values. And I think when we're young, especially in those adolescent stages where, you know, middle school and high school, we 
aren't so much aware of what we value. We're so young. We're still developing and growing and figuring things out that it doesn't come apparent until I would say into college or some of you might say even after college or college years. So I'm talking about your 20s, that transitional adult age where we really become aware of our values and we seek like-minded people. And oftentimes people are, it's sometimes it seems like we're aligned in values and then we grow and we evolve and we change. Other times people we wouldn't think to relate that we would relate to, we do. And in some ways having shared or aligned values also can give you an anchor to the friendship of where you know the two of you will meet at in between, right? So if you are to be encouraged or encountering in a crisis or something wrong in your life, something, a problem, something you're very upset about, you can count on your friend to know what it is that can anchor you in that crisis because the two of you are sharing in your values, how you perceive the world and what you find as important to help and bring you back when you feel lost or overwhelmed or struggling emotionally. Yes, I would just like to add to that. Um, that you know, one of the biggest gifts you have given me, I know we're having such a love fest right now, um, but is that you help me remember who I am too. And I try to seek to do that for you. You know, our world is so wild and this life can be so chaotic, especially when we're trying to do our best and we lose sight, we're extended, and you as a mother have so much of your attention, rightfully so, for your beautiful son. And sometimes we can get caught up and to be able to remind one another of the essence of our being and that that essence in and of itself is valuable and valued. It's so important. Absolutely. And, you know, you really don't discover that about a person unless you're engaging in vulnerability. And the opposite, let's say for the purpose of today's discussion, the opposite of vulnerability is competition. And insecurity manifests as competition among friends. So I'm sure all of us right now can identify a friend, a family member who is always that competitive type. And then when we sit and and perceive that person, we can see that they're insecure. We understand maybe theoretically what drives them to engage in that behavior or talk a certain way. And this is where, when this happens in friendships, it it acts as a barrier. It doesn't allow for safety, getting to know each other, working through hurts or working through hardships. It doesn't allow opportunity to continue to invest in the relationship. So if we sit in the space of vulnerability, it opens a doorway in so many ways to invest further into the friendship, which then begins to feel very strong, very safe. When I birthed my son, I knew, I knew obviously, I want my husband, my mom, and my best friend. They are my anchors, and there was no way that I, I mean, I know I could have done it without her. I mean, every woman can, but there was no way in my mind that I could go through that without having my best friend there. Also, because in those moments when I'm birthing and you 
you know, the other moms out there understand you need, you need anchors, you need people to guide you along. And my husband was amazing and did the best he could. And having her there also reminded me so much of the strength within me. It was like a little voice. Her voice was like the a voice within that was basically saying, you have more to get. Keep going. You can do this. I see it. I know it. It's there. And it was so helpful. And in the moment of pushing my son out, oh, I'm going to cry. I could hear. I'm already crying. (laughs) I could hear your voice saying, Ashley, he's almost here. And it was like, I, it was just, um, it was so amazing. And so, you know, because my husband was having his own experience of having his son and he was there. It was so helpful to have the friend there too, who was in a different grounded space because it wasn't her baby. And so it was so, um, it, I'll just never forget it. I will never forget it. And in some ways there was, like I said, no way I could have done it. And, and We're sharing about our friendship because really to just sort of share the story, don't you think? To share how we have built such a solid and sustainable friendship over time, like transcending space, distance, and everything. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do agree. And, And for me, understanding any of these concepts, I mean, you can remember in grad school of us studying, trying to understand you know, this kind of material that you talk about in your psych chats becomes so alive and so visceral in talking about stories and real life and real lived experiences. And yes, I just want to see your birth of your baby was absolute highlight of my life and and that kind of trust I also want to name does not come easily yeah you know yeah. That, that that is a foundation that that is built over time through many instances of having test testing I should say um the trust definitely And I remember the first time that we had, for me, was a difficult conversation where I had had a conflict with somebody and I didn't feel like, I wasn't sure, I didn't know if I had your support. And it was in the early days of our friendship. And I remember how I felt even in my body and this you know, this is vulnerability. And I had a choice. I had a choice where I could have reacted to my shame trigger. Even now remembering it, I feel my cheeks flush and I feel my heart beat a little faster because it was something I was so vulnerable about. And I consciously had this choice of, okay, you can either not invest that much more in this friendship. It's a new friend. You have other friends. You can walk away or keep it superficial. Or you can do something different this time and lean into the vulnerability and and risk trusting her. And I knew enough of you at the time that that you were worthy of my vulnerability and of my trust, even though it still felt like a very, very big risk. And I decided to lean into that anyway and go ahead and share with you what my concerns were and how what my feelings about the situation were. And you, I'll never forget, you immediately dropped down. I can still see your face across the cafe table that we were sitting at on campus. And you looked at me 
right in the eyes and said, I totally understand that. You absolutely have my support, no question. And that felt so good to me, so good to my heart. And I was so glad that I had taken that risk, even though it was very scary, so much so that all these years later, I can still feel the fear in my body. I remember that. And we've talked about that a few times over the years. And that's such a great example of taking a risk because we can't talk about vulnerability without talking about risk because it is a risk. And in that moment, there was no question for me. It was like what the issue was, was meaningless to me. What was important to me was the friendship we were creating and so it wouldn't matter it was like yeah you know drop everything else and I am here for you and I align with where you see this what you see this as and where you want this issue to go and um and so you you're so right in mentioning the risk and I mean I feel like I have risked I can't think of a specific example if you remember one go ahead and name it but just so many things um where I felt so insecure after sharing things with you Mm. or and I was the anxiety part of me you know would ruminate over it or was it did she think I was being bitchy or unsupportive and and so that that comes with the territory when we're vulnerable is that it feels uncomfortable and it feels scary. And, and then when it's received in a way that feels healthy or in a way that feels non-judgmental or, um, you know, in a way that feels manageable, then it's like a, a reinforcement that we can continue with moments of vulnerability throughout Um, you know, as we continue to relate. And I have to say, and I want to name to all of you listening, that not all friendships are so lovey-dovey, so healthy. And remember that the two of us, for a living, we communicate. We teach others how to communicate. We We embody to our clients what it means to live vulnerably, but also bravely and, and, you know, based in love and compassion. And so understanding that I can be this type of way all I want. If the other person in the friendship is not in any way reciprocating, well, then that creates some challenges. And I bet some of you are thinking, well, what if, I have been vulnerable and the other person, you know, has shut me out or has shut me down, then what? And I'm curious, what do you, is there anything you have to say about that? Mm. Yes, I think it comes back down to this idea of having an ongoing assessment of if somebody deserves your vulnerability and and it's difficult to discern because sometimes we might be vulnerable and either the other person doesn't recognize that where we're coming from is a vulnerable thing or they're not in the place to receive it and there's a further rupture or miscommunication or just being out of sync And so if it's a situation like that, I think it's appropriate to give somebody a chance again to come back and say, you know, my feelings were hurt. Or, you know, I appreciate that you were trying to offer support, but I think I really needed somebody to to listen to me instead of come up with solutions. And... And then that gives the other person another opportunity to show up for you or not. 
And if they cannot, that doesn't necessarily mean the end of the friendship, but it might help in gaining clarity over what kind of friend that is. I think it's important to be clear on what we have, what the expectations that we have of one another is. Like for instance, with you, I can always trust that, well, we check in with one another and say, hey, are you in a good place for this? Is this okay uh, for me to share something that might be kind of heavy? Or do you have a minute? I, I want to share something I'm really excited about. But there are, and we, we have a kind of friendship where we can experience a lot of those things, where we can have a processing kind of connection where we can go and have fun and go and have a spa day or make these videos together. We have a wide range, but it's also okay, even appropriate to have friends that maybe are your friends that you know you can have a good time with. But if you, you know, this may not be a friend that you can really connect with on a heart to heart level, but you know that you have a really good time doing things with them. So if you have tickets to a concert or have an opportunity to go out of town and maybe your bestie isn't available or some other obstacle is in the way, you know that you travel well with this person or that you can really have a good time together. And that's okay. And that's, that's good. And to embrace that while also acknowledging that you know, if you're having a hard time, maybe that's not the friend that you go to and, and who you call. And there is some research out there on different types of friendship, of the friends that you call when you want to have the supportive ear, the friend that you call when you have a good time, or perhaps the friend that you call when you need someone to kind of kick you in the butt where you say, this is a change I want to make. And the friend will go, all right, well, let's do this. Enough talking about it. Let's get it done. And each of those friendships is valuable for their own sake. And sometimes getting clear about what kind of friendship it is can help prevent some of those more painful moments or even confusion of, wait a minute, I thought we were friends. How come you're not meeting this need for me? When really that just wasn't the type of friendship that it was, and that's okay. Definitely, you're talking about something I think we need to sort of um, zoom in on, and that is that there is no one one type of friend and all of I'm sure all of us we know this in our life we have the friends for this the friends for that just like she was saying and it is so you said something so um, poignant and that is maybe clarifying you know okay this is the friend who meets this these needs in me this is the friend that meets these needs so that we don't have any confusion sometimes that that friend sometimes that other friend you may not be on the same page and that's something that needs to be worked out but normalizing the fact that yes we have a variety of different relationships and friendships in our life and it's so needed and you might have that one friend who meets many needs of those, and that is so wonderful and so to be cherished. And if you don't, that's okay too. I think we could go on and on and talk about how oftentimes friendships can become toxic. And I've mentioned several pieces about that, and that has to do with competitiveness and insecurity and... And I don't need to define toxicity. I'm sure many of you 
can already sense that in your life with certain people. And so we don't need to spend a lot of time on that. But I would say this, and we'll be wrapping up soon, but I would say that with regard to toxic energy or toxic people, how you can tell that a friendship is no longer serving you, you can tell in several ways. Are you feeling burdened when this person texts or calls you? Are you feeling avoidant to responding or annoyed? Or on the other hand, are you feeling obligated to text back or spend time with them? Or feeling resistance to when you know it's the day you agreed to hang out and you're really not wanting to do it? Why is that? I encourage you to reflect on why those feelings might be coming up. Is it because the person doesn't do this or do they do too much of this or that? And honoring the idea that it is okay to break up with certain friends when they no longer serve us. That is such a difficult one. I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on on breaking up with a friend. Well, you know I'm not very good at it. <laughs> is That's that why true. you said that? Because you're just calling me out. No. <laughs> well, I was thinking that that is a challenge for you. Um, <laughs> because you are such a nice and kind person. But you make room for a lot of a lot of people and no matter what they bring. And I think that is a really wonderful quality about you. And it's my ability to take space from certain friendships is not something that I'm even necessarily proud of. Um, because I think sometimes it's a product of not leaning into that vulnerability and keeping myself safe. But it's, I guess I'm just asking you because it is difficult. You know, it's not like a romantic relationship where we said, okay, we're in this partnership and that has certain bounds, you know, don't want to simply say exclusive because that's not always the case, but that has certain expectations of that partnership and to say, okay, this partnership is no longer working for me has a very clear definition and sometimes people move to staying friends. Often they take space and are no longer. But there's no, there's nothing like, let's just be friends. There's nothing like that to say when you're breaking up with a friend. <laughs> Where you say, you know, encounters, you, what we don't typically just say you know, after we hang out, I feel really drained. <laughs> or, you know, when we hang out, you never ask about how I'm doing. Or anytime I bring up something you make it about you. And, and those aren't typically things that we really want to say because while they may be good feedback for a person, it's not always received that way. And it's more received as being mean and rejecting and that is a difficult thing to to navigate especially if you are going to be revolving in similar circles or friendship circles or other community groups with somebody it's difficult to establish safe boundaries without burning bridges or or causing a ripple effect of harm. Absolutely, yeah. You know, establishing boundaries without burning bridges, what you just said. And in reality, let's be real. Are all of us really going to send that text outlining why we don't want to continue to hang out with this person? I mean, maybe some of us do. And hooray, like hooray for you for, for doing that. And in reality, that doesn't happen. 
And so we all make us. We do small behaviors that try to send this implicit message to this individual. So we may not respond to their text or we respond way later or we're always busy, right? We all know these behaviors and what happens. And I'm here to say that that's okay. That even if you are not if you are not outlining why specifically to that person, why you no longer want to, you know, hang out as frequent or you just weren't feeling the vibe, you don't always have to owe them an explanation and it's difficult. And yes, we're all about communication and transparency and there's a time and a place. I think in some cases it would be important for you to communicate why you need some space from that person And in other times, there may not be a level of investment to even share why you're not feeling it anymore. And that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. So in our closing of this, just to review a few pieces here um, as a reminder for all of us, and that is, and I'm going to name them again, that is mutually sharing and vulnerability, leaning into vulnerability non-defensive communicating and not allowing insecurity to feed our competitiveness. Those are just some of the main points we discussed here today with some examples. And what else do you want to say for us? I just want to say that I, as if it is not already clear, but that I value our friendship so much. And I feel so, so blessed to be able to share in this experience with you of talking to your online community, which I know means so much to you. And I have been able to witness even though I am not somebody who experiences ASMR, I have loved your videos and watched every single one of your videos from day one and have read almost every single comment. And so I feel really privileged to be invited into this really special place where where people do share your values of kindness and walking on this earth with a intention of being gentle and kind and taking care of one another and of self. And I just really hope that everybody watching this video gets exactly what they need. Yeah, I think that is so beautifully put. And um, I'm so glad that you're willing to come to this space. And for all of you listening and watching, I would really love to hear how you have received this and, um, you know, this style of video. But I loved what you said about this special place. And I remember when I told you about um, doing ASMR and you were so excited. You were like, holy beep. And you were so excited. And you guys watching, anytime I get a mean comment or like a creepy, gross comment, I always think, oh, I'm going to screenshot it and send it. And she sends it to me already before. So she really does read these comments. And we're kind of sometimes like WTF, like with the weirdos, you know, on the internet. Um, Yeah. So I, I am just so glad that we did this, that we were able to share with you, the viewers, parts of our friendship, because it is so much a part of my life. And I invite any questions or clarification on things. You know, in the past, her and I have discussed doing a podcast together, but it's such a saturated uh, market, so to speak, around therapy podcasts and everything. So we kind of never really followed up. 
if you like this style of video, we can certainly make space and time for more, whether it's topics of mental health or other life scenarios or topics. That's where we welcome that. We've discussed this before and we could definitely work on sound and things like that if this sort of video is received well. So... Thank you so much, all of you, for watching us today, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.